Hi guys, thanks for joining me again. In this video I want to talk a little bit about close to the table play using a combination bat with long pips or anti-spin. Uh, what I'm focusing on is the styles of play in this particular video. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, what's good, what are the advantages of playing close to the table using a combination bat, what are some of the disadvantages that you'll find playing close to the table using a combination bat, and finally, just to talk a little bit about the um, what I would call the five, I guess, basic styles that you can use playing close to the table, and what I would, how I would rank them in terms of uh, effectiveness as you move into the upper levels of play, and just to give you an idea, basically, of uh, as you're moving and getting better, uh, if you're at a style that's less effective, how you can maybe move to a more effective style and improve your game um, without too much drama. So that's what we're kind of covering in this particular video. Uh, first, I'll just start by defining what I mean by close to the table play. Uh, by that, I don't mean necessarily standing so that your legs are touching the table as in so close that you know, you're too close. What we're talking about here is anywhere sort of where you're pressuring the opponent and you're, you're within sort of, you know, it can vary depending on the power, but within a, you know, a couple of steps of the table basically most of the time. Uh, so you know, it doesn't mean that a close to the table player will never find himself away. And sometimes he will, it may be the appropriate thing at that time. But most of the time a close to the table player is going to find himself within a couple of easy steps of the table. Not right on it, but certainly in the near vicinity. Um, with the occasional need to go out wide to the side or back as the occasion persists. But we don't want to play, as a close to the table player, we don't want to play all our time there. The idea is not to, if you're forced away doing chopping or lobbing, the idea is not to try and win the point from there. The idea is to try and force our way back in to where we want to be and maintain this close to the table position. Okay? Uh, for me, although I'm now playing as a close to the table player, I don't want to be here. I want to be close enough, close enough that I don't have a lot of angle to cover, but far away that I can still get a swing and get some lift on the ball. If I'm too close, I can't do that. So, that's roughly what I mean by close to the table. So, in this zone, within a couple of steps of the table, pressuring our opponent with our play. Now, having just discussed that, what, what I want to talk about now is just what are some of the advantages that you'll find from playing this close to the table type of style. Now, I'm not going to get into the styles just yet. I'm just talking about general advantages regardless of what style you really play. That these more or less apply. The type of advantages that you'll immediately find by playing close to the table are firstly, there's a lot less ground to cover. Okay? We, we don't have to go work wide coverage because being close to the table, a ball that's going wide here, one little step and you can cut it. It may take two or three steps to get it if I'm all the way back here. So, Court coverage, we need to be, in terms of actual covering the court, it's less work, there's le less trouble going on. So that's definitely one good thing. Less angles to cover, less movement needed. Okay. We can also, um, by being close to the table, our long pit play, our anti-spin play, becomes more effective in general. And the reason it becomes more effective is that our opponent, because we're closer, our opponent's got less time to react, he's got less time to adjust, and also we're in a better position by being close to the table. We're often in a better position to capitalise on his mistakes. Now, what that means is not only when the opponent hits something and you're twiddling or changing it or doing something a little bit different, not only has the opponent got less time to figure that out, but when he does something a little bit weak, if you're playing a defensive long-range game, he may make that little bit of a mistake, put a hesitant one in. But unless you've got very fast footwork to come in and pick it off, 
that little mistake, you may not be able to take advantage of it. And it requires very fast footwork. And I know as, as we're getting towards the age of that 35 to 40 to 50, you know, to 50, and we're not as fast as we used to be, it's much nicer to be up here. You get that little mistake, the ball goes up a little bit, six inches higher, and you can come in and, and pick it off quickly. Whereas playing back from the table, it wouldn't help you. You need your opponent to make a bigger mistake to allow you to counter-attack and come in and counter-attack. So the effect, I guess, of your adjust, your changes is bigger. And when your opponent makes a mistake, his mistakes can be smaller, but you can still take advantage of them. So you kind of gain both ways in that respect, playing up to the table. Uh, definitely what I, I can vouch for this one, Playing close to the table, much easier on the body, physically. Much easier on the legs, on the back. Uh, there's a lot less bending compared to playing long range and chopping. Uh, might be a bit different if you're playing long range and lobbing, but if you're, if you're a lobber, you're probably not going to be using a combination bat anyway. Um, but compared to long range defence, yeah, definitely. Uh, my legs and back are currently thanking me a lot because I can play through a, a whole tournament um, and not be sore the next day, which um, for me uh, hasn't happened for a long, long time. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. So for those of us who are getting a few aches and pains, or already have a few injuries, um, a couple of niggles like I've got as well, um, it's much physically more forgiving. So definitely, that's definitely a plus, especially as you're talking about having a long tournament day. Um, in the first match of the day, so what? It may not be a big difference. After you've played six games, six matches, that physical factor starts to become more important. And for myself, when I have to go and do that the next day, and the next day, and the next day, and day five, and day six, in a week-long tournament, um, for me that's critical. Uh, I need to be as good on the, the fifth day, the sixth day, as I am on the first. And um, currently I'm not, um, because although aerobically fit enough, uh, body-wise, I hurt too much, and, and this helps. So I think all of you guys who are playing close to the table can probably agree with me on that one. Okay, in terms of switching from defence to attack, it's much easier playing close to the table. Now I mean two things by that when I talk about switching from defence to attack. I don't, I mean, well, one, the actual changing the, the pace and the style of the game. Being able to, as I mentioned before, being able to capitalise on an opponent's mistake and force him out of position perhaps to be able to get in and attack the ball, that's easier, I think, close to the table. Because you're in a position where, yeah, as I said, a small mistake, it's easier for you to capitalise. You can, from close to the table, he can hit a good shot, but if you can block it into a tight spot, you can then take advantage of that. But the other reason that I'm meaning that it's easier to switch from defence to attack is that as a defender, when you're playing as a long-range defender, your hip position and your body position is, all, is often focused on taking the ball here. So the hips tend to be very low. The waist and the hips and your body position tends to be really down here a lot. And then to attack, if you attack from down here, you can't. it's very tough. So you have to... Defend low, but come up a little bit, lift the body and the hips to then attack. So it's, it's, it's like down, up. If you're close to the table, you're here, there's really no need to adjust your body height um, to go from defence to attack because you're taking the ball at roughly the same height. Okay? That makes transitioning um, much faster and easier than it is for a, defend, a long range defender. Um, just one of the benefits um, of uh, playing at that height. Um, uh, also, <laughs> I guess from being close to the table, is one of the factors that you have to worry about as a long range defender uh, is removed, which is dealing with so much the changes of pace uh, or being brought in, in and out. You may still have to deal with changes of pace. A crafty opponent will hit faster or slower to mess with your timing. But as a long-range defender, you also have to be very aware of being brought in, into the table, out of the table, into the table. Close-range defender, uh, close-range defender, attacker, whatever, close to the table player, 
you're here. You might go there or here, but the court coverage, the in and out, um, the opponent doesn't have that leeway to move you in and out. Um, so that's again much easier on you and on your game. Uh, you need a lot less power being close to the table play. Uh, in some way, <laughs> in some ways. Uh, in other ways, no. Um, what I mean by that is basically because you're close to the table, you're closer to your opponent, you don't have to hit as hard you know, to have as much effect because the opponent has naturally less time. So it's more effective in that respect. Um, the difference, I guess, that, that's how I mean it in, in the positive way. I guess the difference is as a long-range defender, if you're only occasionally hitting, which is how I used to play, you normally don't need a very fast attack anyway because it's the surprise. You're usually hitting a surprise attack close to the table or you're only hitting balls that are easy setups and you're, you're hitting, hitting them away. Um, so you don't need a lot of power. Um, but that said, close to the table player, usually yeah, you're so much close to the opponent, you've got more power, he's just got less time from view, view of that fact anyway. So that can often help. Uh, also, one other thing I probably mentioned from that is being close to the table, it's much easier to feed off your opponent's power, even if you don't have it. Because you can be blocking with the inverted, uh, from a long way away, if the opponent's looping and you're trying to counter-attack, you've got to make the pace. You've got to hit it. Um, if you try and be gentle, you're not going to get anything going back over the table, certainly not with any effective pace. Up close to the table, the opponent attacks and you block. You're getting effective pace just feeding off his. Um, so that's a good usage as well for those of us who can't hit hard at all. You can still play a very effective counter-attacking game, just feeding your blocks off his attacks with your inverted side and getting power from that without a lot of work. Um, you can be 70 years old and still be able to do that quite effectively, even if you can't turn or swing or do anything. If you can just stick the bat out, let him hit, bang, 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 he'll provide you with pace, um, which is um, quite, quite a good thing. Uh, another thing, just to mention in terms of uh, going along with the physical aspects of it, by being close to the table, uh, in most respects compared to a long range defender, against quality opponents, the points will be shorter. Okay. Against, some, against an opponent who can't get through your attack and gives up and pushes, yes, they, they will be long rallies, okay? unless you can attack a few. You'll have long rallies there. But they won't be physically very demanding. You'll just be standing here pushing, 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 hitting occasionally. But as a long range defender in the past, I know my games, um, quite often in a best of five game, I was going 20 minutes, 25 minutes, and my attacking friends were going 10 minutes, you know, 15 at most for a best of, best of five, you know, playing three matches. Um, I was doing twice the work. Um, that's pretty tough physically. Um, so the points will generally, against a good attacking player, when you're close to the table, the points are going to be short. You'll, you'll get in an attack and hit a winner or two, short point. He'll attack you. You'll block it and vary it. He'll either make mistakes, you hit another one, you'll block it away, or you'll hit one through you and you'll make a mistake. But either way, you're not going to have a lot of long extended points against a decent attacker who's brave enough to go for his shots. So um, that can be, um, you, know, you, you don't have to be on the table as long. So if you're after value for money, not so good. If you're after being able to play six matches in a day, much, much easier because your matches will be a lot shorter. Okay. Those are some of the advantages, I guess, well, hopefully most of them because those are the ones I thought of when I sat down and started thinking about all these benefits of playing close to the table. It's not all a bed of roses. There are disadvantages though and you have to be aware of these as well or you should be aware of these as well. Um, because they do factor into the, the game. And here's some of the disadvantages that um, a few minutes thought um, highlighted to me. First one I've noticed is your reflexes are under a little bit more pressure. And this is, I guess, the one that probably, 
from close to the table players, this is the one that gets talked about or highlighted the most, especially as you start getting older. Because everybody will tend to say, oh, you're getting older, your reflexes start to go. And while that's true, I think, to a, a certain extent, and having done a little bit of reading on it, uh, just out of curiosity, wondering, I couldn't find a lot, but in the past, I, I did look it up a bit. What I have found in the past tends to suggest that although there is a, a little bit of a decline sort of after that 25, 30 onwards, you really don't have anything significant or super significant until you hit about 71, 72, at which time a lot of things in the body start getting more difficult. Uh, not just reflexes, but um, holding muscle mass, running and training is hard. Around that 72 age in the studies seems to be where the body starts to just naturally find it harder to maintain. And this is based on people who train consistently um, all the time. And um, what they found is basically, yeah, these guys, they kept training, they kept looking after themselves. And even so, even though while they were doing that, as they got older, they needed a, a few more rest days to keep fresh. But even though they kept fresh, they also found just about that age, 72 or so, um, things just started to naturally decline. And, you know, until somebody finds a, a super secret way to fix that, um, you just have to live with it. However, getting back to my point, um, I'm now at 38, getting into well into slow reflexes territory. Um, and I find that I don't think my reflexes are all that bad. Um, I think table tennis helps keep your reflexes sharp. So if anything, I, I'd say don't really worry about it. You, as fast as you are, um, your reflexes will tend to stay with you. And what's much more important than reflexes is not necessarily... Reflexes are good to get things done fast. You know, that's the benefit of reflexes. But what's more important than that is anticipation. You know, learning where to go. And the second thing that's also most important is doing the right thing. No point having fast reflexes if your reflex action is the wrong thing, the wrong stroke, the wrong bad angle, the wrong place. Reflexes will not help you in any. All that will happen is you'll, you'll lose faster. Everything will, you'll do it quick, but you'll do it wrong. It's much better to be slower and do the right thing. Okay, get your decision making correct, get the bad angle correct. And okay, a couple you might miss and go past you. But the ones you hit will go on. So reflexes, yeah, it's great if you've got them, but anticipation, decision making, getting the bad angle correct, much more important. Okay, but that's as it may. Close to the table, the second thing that's a, a slight disadvantage um, perhaps this is just for me, but I think it probably applies to a lot of people as well, is by playing close to the table, you're also making the serve game, your service and your return of service, you're magnifying its importance. Okay? If you, if you are lacking a good serves or if you're lacking good return of serves and you want to stand up here close to the table, it's, it's, you're making life really tough because... You're basically standing, what I, what I call it, is you're standing in the mouth of the cannon and you're waiting for the, thunder, the cannonball to come down and blast you. Okay? So without good serves, good return of serves, uh, you're just basically standing there uh, waiting for the opponent to unleash on you. Okay? Now, by good serves and good return of serves, I don't necessarily mean point-winning ones that automatically win you the point. What I mean at this, in relevance to this, is good serves and good return serves that just stop the opponent unleashing a third ball thunderbolt at you and blasting at you. You know, even if he attacks, letting him, making him attack, but not with a lot of power, so that you do have time to decide where it's going to do what it's what it's doing. So, if there's a long range defender, all I had to do was serve tight when I didn't want them to big loop or serve long to certain places and get back. And provided I did that well, I didn't need great serves. Um, as a return of serve, all I really needed was to push the ball in a couple of directions and move it around and then take, start going back into position. And if I popped it up a little bit higher, provided I didn't do it horribly wrong 
and really, really short that they could angle anywhere, I was generally fairly safe because I was going back in my defensive mode. Um, not so true close to the table um, when you're playing close to the table. You've got to be a little bit better and you need more than just a push. You really, depending on what style you're going to choose, a flick um, and the ability to loop long serves um, definitely going to be helpful. So you've magnified the important, importance of that. Uh, close to the table, if you can think quicker. I mean, I guess the demands on your mental processes playing close to the table are higher. Because you're playing close to the table, you have less time to decide what to do. You have less time to react. So uh, you have less time, for example, to decide when to twiddle or if to twiddle or even sort of, so all those kind of things that you're making decisions. As a long range defender, you have lots of time. You know, the ball's coming, coming, oh yeah, twiddle, no, I'm chasing the ball down, I've got time. You don't have it here, it's, it's there, the ball's on you. Less time to think about, okay? So sometimes that can mean that you're, you have to make your decision simpler or your pattern simpler, um, unless you're a fast thinker. But yeah, mentally, the decisions you've got to make, you've just got less time to do it, okay? Provided you've got enough time, then it doesn't really matter. But if you're struggling to make the right decisions, especially in terms of twiddling, then you're better off slowing down, cutting down the twiddling until you have a weaker return from your opponent and then you can use that extra time to decide. Um, that's probably better than trying to twiddle and just making a hash of it because you're not keeping up with the pace. Uh, probably the, the last thing that I've mentioned in terms of a, a disadvantage is more a psychological thing than anything else and that is it, it can be difficult uh, psychologically to stay calm when the opponent's about to put a very strong attack at you. And what I found, this is for me, um, one of the things I'm finding, I've been finding a little bit diffi more difficult and I'm getting the hang of it now, I'm getting better at it, I'm going to have to keep working at it. But as a defender, it wasn't something I ever had to do very much of. So I'm, I'm coming to terms with it. I am improving on but I'm having to really concentrate on it a lot. And it's that ability to say, okay, I'm here, I've returned the ball, I've done a bad job, I'm going to wait, and I'm going to see what's going on. And the two things you've got to avoid is, firstly, when the opponent makes the shot, is I've, you've got to avoid, and I've got to avoid as well, got to avoid that panic thing of, he hit it hard, therefore I'll hit it hard. So it's that instinctive bang, Whack, whack, trying to, whatever he does, as hard as he hits, you hit back fast. That, that instinctive panic reaction of, ah, whack. Trying to stay calm and just saying, okay, he hit it, block it, block it, put it there, relax, put it. I mean, <laughs> I think it's partly the fact that there's something coming towards you at a very high speed. I mean, it's a table tennis ball. I mean, we know it doesn't hurt that much. It can sting a little bit. But instinctively, the fact that you know that this thing's going to come at you quick, um, you don't know where it's going, and it, the instinctive thing is to go, <clears throat> if you can fight that off and stay relaxed, and just, you know, just it's coming, I'll just wait. And I'm not going to jerk at the ball, I'm just going to block it. You know, and when I want to hit a bit harder, I will just slowly ramp up. If you can do that, if you can keep calm in that situation, you'll probably make a pretty good close to the table player um, because, <laughs> because that's half the battle, staying smooth under that sort of stress. Um, the other thing is, uh, I find, and this is one thing that I'm doing quite a lot of, and I, I wish I wasn't, but I'm doing it, and I'm having to work against it, and that is the instinct to pick where he's going, pick where my opponent's hitting before he's hit it. And, as a defender, it's, it's usually you have a little bit more time. You can start moving, and if he goes, no. Or you can just get balanced and kind of wait it out and, and see. 
Um, and you usually have a little bit more time to get balance back going the other way. Not always, but you have that ability to um, do that a bit more. But if you're close to the table and your opponent, you've put the ball up a little bit high, your opponent looks like he's going to go to that forehand, but he hasn't hit it yet. If you go, he'll go that way. Or he'll go at you, which is even, maybe even worse, um, that kind of thing. Um, probably the... It's hard to say what the worst one is. They're both bad because if you wait here with your bat back behind you here, it's very hard to get the bat in front of the body. You know, that, that's not easy. So you end up kind of that a bit. If you're here, so you know, basically if you wait there and he hits there, you, you're stuffed because there's just no way you're going to get the bat. You know, you're not going to get... It. The most you could do is maybe do that, you know, if, if you're really smart, I mean, I'm not that smart. There's no way that I would just... I mean, most of us will swing it over, will swing it around, and by that stage it's too late. Being able to just cock your wrist and just cut across, um, I don't know, maybe I do that instinctively sometimes, but I don't think so. So basically, if you're waiting on this side and he goes that way, you know, if you pick this side, he goes that way, you're stuffed. If you pick this side and he goes that way, you're, you're a little bit better off in that most of the times you're probably going to have your long pips or your anti-spin on this side and you're going to be able to go and just slide your arm across and play that sort of shot. You may get away with it. You're certainly not going to do anything aggressive with it, but you may get away with it by virtue of the fact that it is your long pips and or anti-spin and it may put it back slow enough you may fluke the bat angle enough for it to get tight if you do <laughs> if you do do not do not do not wait there and do it again you've got to come back you've got to recover and get back into position so if you do get caught try not to wait there and do that I've seen people do that and they come straight back and they do it again if you get caught, recover back to the middle. And that brings me to what I'm talking about, what you should be doing, which is basically when the opponent's coming at you hard, rather than picking a side, wait. Just wait. Stay balanced. Anticipate, by all means, you're, you're trying to pick where he's going. But if you can just wait there and then just do that or that and wait with your bat in front, okay, and your bat above the table, um, it's funny, I'm, I keep, I'm telling things on myself here, um, all of my bad habits. Occasionally I have this habit as a defender because, um, I don't know whether it's because I finished down there or whatever, I find myself every so often, they're hitting the ball and my bat's down here. And I'm trying to block, and it, it, the bat's, I'm bringing my bat up to block. I'm kind of like, I've done something, pushed it or hit it or something, and they're hitting over there and I'm having to bring my bat up, my bat's stuck below the level of, level of the table basically. So instead of being here, I'm there, and then they hit it and I'm... I don't know why I do that. I'm not quite sure how I do that, I just know that I've done it a few times in matches, you know, because it's immediately obvious. Um, so when they're hitting hard, you wait. Anticipate, be ready by all means, but try and wait relaxed, move, move. Don't pick. Wait for him to hit it. You'll have time. You may not get everyone, but generally you'll have time. Um, having said that, I'm still fighting to do that better. So I have, um, if you're finding it hard, I have all the sympathy in the world. Um, because as someone who's played from a distance quite a while and not really played a lot close to the table um, this style against um, good players for quite a while, that's probably what I'm finding the hardest, just to relax wait and let the ball come on each side and just pick. I tend to snatch a little bit and I tend to pick a side and have my opponent go the other way. But I'm getting better because I'm, that's something I'm saying to myself, I'm not doing well, I'm going to keep working out. Okay. Right, those are the advantages and disadvantages, or at least the ones that I can think of, staying close to the table. Um, in later, the next video, or the next video I do on these styles, I'll talk a little bit about long range 
defending, but close to the table, that's what we're talking about. Now, what I want to talk about here is, is five basic styles of playing close to the table and where I think they are in terms of effectiveness as we move up into the intermediate to advanced ranks and why I think that and if you're at one of these ranks what you should be doing to make your game more effective and, and that kind of thing. Now I think there's roughly five. It's, it's not as clear cut as simple quite as that but you know roughly that's, that's a pretty good um, idea of it. There's a bit of blending and against certain players you may play more towards one style than another. That's all fine. But roughly these are the five that we're, we're kind of looking at. Okay. In terms of effectiveness, I'm going to start at the top and work my kind of way down a bit here. I think, and again, personal opinion only, I think probably the most effective style with the long pips or anti-spin close to the table, I think the most effective is to be using uh, the long pips or the anti-spin to set up your attacks with the inverted side. Okay. Now, to go along with that, that means that you will be twiddling your bat to take advantage of weak balls on the side you don't normally hit with, you know, that you don't normally use the inverted rubber on. So for me, the inverted on the forehand, the long pips are on the backhand, I'm standing close to the table, weak balls on the forehand get attacked, good balls on the backhand get blocked, pushed, um, opened with on the backhand, weak balls on the backhand, if I have time and am balanced, I will twiddle an attack. Um, if I don't and I want to keep an attack going, I will roll with the long pips. But then be aware that if the ball comes back there weak again, I want to attack. That's, I think, the strongest style um, of playing with long pips or anti-spin close to the table. And the reason why I'm saying that is mainly because at that level a lot of table tennis, um, as I talked about in the sort of intermediate, basic intermediate advanced videos, we're talking about taking calculated risks about being aggressive um, to win the points rather than being passive. And what you're doing with this style is you're being as aggressive as you can, you're taking calculated risks, um, you're playing a style that puts pressure on the opponent and you don't give him any safe side to go to because if he goes to what's normally your long pips you're quite prepared to twiddle and hit with that side so you're giving maximum pressure, maximum effectiveness at the same time you're not taking any silly risks on trying to do more with the long pips or the anti-spin than they're really designed to do so I, I think that that's why it's basically the most effective you're attacking as much as you can you're getting the most use, the best use out of your long pips so that's, that's my number one, in my opinion. Okay, the next three styles um, are roughly, they're not exactly the same, in, well, obviously not the same in terms of the style, but I think they can be within a band of effectiveness, and depending on the player, and what he does, who the opponent is. So these three kind of are, are a bit harder to say one's better than the other, but um, they're all better than the last style, I think. Okay. Now the three of these are basically, firstly, using the long pip or anti-spin. Uh, sorry, using yeah, using the long pip or anti-spin to attack with, um, without any twiddling. So, say it doesn't really matter which side around this, but let's say for most people you've got the inverted on the forehand, you have the long pip or anti-spin on the backhand, and what you're basically then trying to do is anything on the forehand that's loose, you'll attack. Anything on the backhand that's loose you'll attack. And if it comes back weak, you will keep attacking with this side. You'll use the long pips and anti-spin. So it's, there's no twiddling, there's no real decision making that's required. Um, and you're getting a little bit of variation just from the ball going side to side. But anything that's here, you're going to try and go with the long pips with the anti-spin and you're going to try and hit winners with it. Okay, so that's style two. Also, roughly around the same side as this one, is playing defensively, close to pushing to the table, so you're in at the table, but you're playing a defensive game, twiddling the bat. 
to get the most out of it. So really what you're doing is you're standing up close, you're pushing with the long pips. If they attack, you'll block with the long pips or anti-spin. You'll push with your forehand. You'll twiddle and push with the other side. If they attack, you'll block on either side. It doesn't matter. And if it, you get an easy one, you'll probably go to the inverted and attack it. You may hit one with the long pips. That, that's, that's really up to you. That's not the important focus. The important focus of this third style is the fact that you're playing a defensive game up to the table using your twiddling to get good variation and playing that. I think that can be roughly as effective as um, just do attacking but without it, depending on the player and what he's doing. The fourth one, which can be roughly around that side, uh, the same level, is using a, a long pips or an anti-spin to cover a weak stroke, a weak side. Typically the backhand, but okay, it can be the forehand for some people. But you're using it to cover that hole in your game, um, most typically so that you can attack on your forehand with the inverted. If they get at your backhand, you will block or push with the anti-spin or long pips. You won't really try and do anything too aggressive with it. Um, you won't even really open with it very much. You'll just put the ball back and then come back and look for the forehand, look for your inverted side again. Those three styles, I think, are, depending on the player, are all roughly around the same in terms of your effectiveness. Now, how can they be improved and brought up to... Well, I think basically what you're looking at is you're looking at that ability to, um, say with the first style, where you're not twiddling at all and you're using the long pips and anti-spin to attack very hard with. A couple of... the ability to twiddle occasionally would improve you immeasurably. It makes life harder for your opponents. So a little bit of twiddling, and you don't have to do anything extravagant when you twiddle. Just push the ball occasionally or block the ball occasionally. You don't even have to do a lot of attacks with the inverted on the other side or with the pips. You're just using it on a simple shot or two to break up the game. That would help a lot in the first stop. Okay, if you can move it so that you're playing, using it to open and then twiddling to finish, well, okay, great. But if not, you can certainly improve it. The third style where you're defending and twiddling on both sides and then occasionally hitting. Um, that's, it, it's a tough one to improve without improving your attack a lot. You know, any improvements you make, you're probably not going to make a lot of improvements in your defence. It's probably fairly tight, fairly good already, because you wouldn't be playing at intermediate level if it wasn't you know, fairly steady. So what you'll find is you probably won't be able to get up to advanced level, you know, unless you're the exception, playing this pure defensive game, even though you're twiddling a lot. Because what you're lacking is that ability to um, pressure the opponent with a winner. Yeah. Having a weapon that he fears, because at the advanced, getting as you get to the advanced level, they don't fear the long pips. You know, that doesn't make them panic just because you hit the ball with the long pips. It's whether you've twiddled, whether you've moved it, and then if they've hesitated a bit, you're coming in and finishing off. So for somebody who's defensively minded and wants to push the ball around and then block and twiddle, the best thing you can probably do if you're already at that intermediate level is develop uh, a killer put away. Even if it's just a one shot put away. You know, but just basically one shot that when the ball's in that area, clobber it and you can put it on 80% of the time, that, that will do you a world of good. doesn't matter if it's forehand or a backhand put away. I would recommend do, use it with the inverted because you'll, get, you'll get, be able to use it more often from a wider range of shots than the long pit. But that would do your gun a lot of good. Um, it really would. It may never get you up to top advanced level because playing that defensive pushing game um, and you're just outgunned and the technology stakes, well, so be it. But you could really play a very tough, awkward game um, doing that. So if you're, if you're that sort of player, bring in one really good attack. Um, that's a, a point winner when the ball's in roughly the right spot. Keep the rest of your game nice and tight. Um, you'll find great 
a great result there because the pressure you'll put on your opponent will be um, magnified a lot, um, you'll find. Third style, that, sorry, the fourth style, where you're using the long picks or anti to cover a weak side. Um, you probably already know what I'm going to say. Um, <laughs> if you're covering a weak side with long pips or anti, um, you well, what I would tend to say is if you're doing that, it's, it's probably one of two things, or the thing I'm thinking of, is usually it's because your technique is lousy and, and you, you haven't trained it. And in terms of the technique, um, I, don't, I haven't seen many people with shoulders or elbows joined funnily that can't hit it. It's usually because your grip sucks and your grip is so bad that you physically cannot turn the wrist properly and do the stuff properly on your backhand side. Or you've got the, you know, or if you, maybe your forehand's terrible, it's usually because your thumb's sitting right up the middle on your forehand. And so, although you can play a, a lovely backhand, you're locking out the forehand. So, my advice to you guys who have that problem, okay, look at your grip first, because it's probably the grip that's making the problem. Okay? If you don't want to change your grip, okay, that's fair enough. You don't have to change your grip. That's, that's you know, personal preference. But look at however you do hold it. Try and look at what you actually can do. Don't just give up on the shot you know, and just say, oh, I can only ever da -da -da, push it or block it with this side. Okay? Don't be afraid to try and extend what you can do with it a little bit more. You'd be surprised that even without much wrist, how much variation with the long pip or anti spin. You've got the push, you've got a shovel push, you've got a little roll, just a basic roll, not a wrist roll, you know, big wrist snap, just a little roll. You know, that's three variations that are very different and that will all still allow you to whack your big forehand rather than just standing there and doing nothing, pushing the ball all day. You know, no reason why somebody, rather than just having to push or just block no reason why you can't do a little roll, a little shovel push. You know, it's not, it's not, you know, it doesn't look fancy, it doesn't look pretty, but it's effective. And um, it's not that hard with a little bit of work. Okay? That will give you a big boost. It's hard to, once you get your forehand up to a pretty good standard, you're going to find it hard to work enough to improve it further, unless you're doing lot, lots and lots of hours of training. So a little bit of improvement of this weak area you'll find that will give you your best boost. Um, just It's basically the law of diminishing returns. Once you've got your strength up to a certain point, um, it becomes better to work on the weakness um, and improve the weakness so that it's instead of weak, it's average. Past average, you may then find that that's the point of diminishing returns on the weakness. You know, it may then be too much work to try and make a weakness into a strength. You know, because you may just not be naturally very good at it. So get your weakness, get that big weakness here, get it to being just average. Then it's probably time to start look at something that you do fairly well. Try and turn that into another strength. You know, or spend some extra time, make that strength even stronger if you can. But you know, it's, it's think, what's the best thing you can do for your game at the time? And usually that weakness is going to be the best thing up to a point, and then it's time to start looking for something else to improve. Okay. Um, those are the first four styles. The last style is what I would call, um, what tends to be called the chicken wing style. And I know there's a couple of you guys out there who are probably going, oh, Greg, you know, stop picking on this here. Okay. I'm not saying it can't work at intermediate level. I'm not even saying it can't work at a fairly advanced level. Okay, it can. If you're a good player, if you've got very good control of the long pips or the anti-spin, if you've got great grasp of tactics, of placement, um, some good serves, um, and maybe even if you've got a monster hit with the other side every now and again, yeah, you can, you can still go a fairly long way. Okay, sure. I don't, I don't argue with that. What the only thing I will say to you guys who are doing that is just this: is that I still firmly, firmly believe that there's nothing you couldn't be doing, that nothing that you're doing now that you couldn't improve with just the ability to basically, instead of covering everything with the long pips, cover the, that side with the long pips and improve your grip 
so that you can cover the other side with the inverted. It's usually a function of your grip, okay, that's making it. Now, I, I just think that because if you're gripping the bat properly, if you're holding the bat correctly, then if you still want a chicken wing, you can. You can still do it. But as soon as you want to hit a forehand or you know with the inverted, you can do that too. So I would say fix the grip, it'll be worth it. Then you can decide when you want a chicken wing, when you want to attack. If your grip is already okay and you're just doing this from instinct or because you're a bit scared, you know, you think the long pips. Um, what happens to some people is they start at beginner ranks, they get beaten a bit, they put a sheet of long pips on and they start to win a few points. And from there it becomes that instinct of, I want to hit every ball with the long pips because my opponent might make a mistake and then that gets less and less effective as you get higher. If that's what's happened to you, and um, that, that it may or may not be, but if that is what has happened to you, having that mental fortitude, the mental courage to say, look, I am, I've got an inverted side, I'm going to use it where appropriate, I'm going to use the long pips where appropriate, I'll twiddle occasionally to spice things up. Doing that and spending six months to get your game together, you will go further than if you only ever do that in 99% of the cases. Yeah. I know there are people who play very high um, doing only this. I just think that they could play even higher if they actually did this but also did that whenever they felt like it. So um, your mileage may vary. Um, you don't have to do what I say. But hey, I really do think it could be more effective. Okay, so those are the five styles and what I think is most effective versus least. What could be done to improve them a little bit? And just some of the overall advantages versus disadvantage of close to the table play. Uh, I know I'm certainly enjoying the change. I'll probably learn quite a, a lot more about it in the months to come um, as I keep finding things out, I will keep reporting them back to you. <laughs> um, and um, again, just thanks for um, watching me today um, to come. For those of you who are looking to play long range defence, there will be an equivalent for um, long range defenders uh, who are playing further away from the table. Um, but that will be coming in the next, uh, within the next week or so. So again, thank you very much and uh, I'll see you soon.